Audiobook Title Military Exchange, 00-06, by Red Story. This work belongs to author Red Story. Source ScribbleHub.com. Prologue, Target Destroyed. Prologue, Target Destroyed. 2030, 25 years after their first appearance. Once more, Earth became hell. We're under attack. I repeat, we're under attack. Eight portals have been spotted. Code Red. Code Red. 1. A long series of sirens roared loudly when portals appeared. It took the form of hundreds of meter-wide black domes with a blood-red glow at the edges. Thousands of soldiers had been engaged. Paratroopers were dropped from C-130 Hercules. While mechanized infantry came in with armored vehicles, the war had begun. Call of duty for every single military soldier. For freedom. Kill them all. Bang. 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 The sound of heavy gunfire could be heard everywhere. So were the explosions and war cry. The entire city had become a battlefield. Huge monsters crawled out of nowhere. They were so huge that the smallest alone was nine meters long. Fighting against them was like fighting against armored vehicles. And among the chaos, an unusual soldier crouched alone behind the bush. Butcher one, how you copy? Solid. With his eyes on the scope, he spoke with a low and heavy voice. Forty-three Ankis and three Magnas are monitored at Portal 8. Need backup. Third Platoon 1st Marine Cavalry Brigade is on your position. Any issue? Affirmative. Many big guys here. Don't make me wait. Hang in there. A horde of ankylodrakes roamed hundreds of meters before him. They took the form of horn-headed ankylosauruses with multilayered calcium armor. Their backs were thick. Their tail was equipped with a spiky ball that would turn a human into minced meat. Nevertheless, modern battle was fighting at a distance. Bang! See ink! And 50 calories BMG rushed off the Barrett M82, an anti-material rifle that had been designed to penetrate modern steel. Flesh and bone were no match against 18 kilojoules of kinetic energy. The result was clear. An ankylodrake slowly died after its head was struck by a projectile as big as a thumbnail. One down, two more incoming. Keep low profile, sergeant. Backup is on the way. Understood. Clack. He cocked the gun after reloading the magazine. With his face behind the mask, the elite soldier lay down silently. More monsters died every time he pulled the trigger. His accuracy is somewhat unrealistic. One shot, one kill from hundreds of meters away the stupid monsters had no idea how their friends were dying. Butcher one to restaurant. Half of Ankis are on the move. Take them out. Keep your perimeter intact. Limited ammo, ma'am. Just hang in there. Don't forget your identity. Reprimanded by his superior, he rubbed the tactical mask, which resembled a monster skull. Vivid green lights could be seen on the mask visor. A monster skull-shaped badge was clearly seen with a cross-shaped machete below it. It was a special logo of the dome, Detachment of Monster Eradication, the most elite operator to face otherworldly beasts hidden. Shit. Turning away from the scope, he rubbed his carrier vest. He just realized that a six-year-old girl can do math with his ammos. There were a few rounds left in the bag. 18 BMGs, 31 slugs of 12 gauge, 3 blocks of C4, and 1 phosphorus grenade remained. It was clearly impossible to carry on with such limited weapons. Moreover, in the crowd, some magnetaras roamed around, a kind of rock monster whose bodies were as big as a house. His composure was being tested. He had to run several times just to find a strategic firing position. The ammos kept draining, and airborne reinforcements were dropped to another portal. The situation was getting worse. Butcher one to restaurant. More Ankis leave their spot to make someone claim insurance, ma'am. Need backup. 60 second. Hold them off. Negative. Low ammo. Use your head, sergeant. Fucking hell. He was too composed in a life or death situation. No matter how far he shot them all, he could be spotted. More monsters were adapted to post-dimensional gravity and Earth's atmosphere. They kept moving while five rounds remained for the light 50. Peeping through the scope, the skull mask visors were shining brightly. His accuracy became more and more terrifying. He could hit their vital spot without doing math or dealing with milliradian dots. One shot, one down. There was no more BMG round. He had no choice but to grab his shotgun and approach the nearest monsters. Bang! He shot Anki's lower jaw with a 12-gauge shot. Their skin was so thick that it had to be hit point-blank. Sometimes he blasted Magnetera's joints with plastic explosive. The rock monsters were neutralized. More and more monsters crawled out of another world. Sixty seconds have passed, ma'am. 
Need backup to Portal 8. ASAP. Hang on. I got exposed. Do something. The number of monsters was ridiculous nonsense. He even shot monsters weak spot with 50 called Desert Eagle. Fighting alone was an impossible mission in the first place. Shockingly, just as he was getting pinned down, the portal showed a nightmare. Megan! I repeat, there's a Megana Drake in Portal 8. Megana Drake, a 56 meter long Komodo dragon with multiple layers of bone like armor, was an impossible enemy to fight against. The monster had an enormous size, which was longer than five school buses in a row. It was so huge that he lost his composure. Butcher 1 to restaurant, request whatever backup available. Damn it, cool your head sergeant. Act like a real warrior. And your fucking real warrior is about to be a meat jerky, ma'am. Do your fucking job. Roger that. Give me five seconds. Situation had gone wrong from worse to Fubar. He didn't care anymore to spout disrespectful words that could take him to the MP. He was frustrated because his commander was always giving him senseless missions. Fighting alone was too much. 2nd Platoon 1st Rocket Battalion. I repeat, 2nd Platoon 1st Rocket Battalion. Artillery support to Portal 8 Butcher 1. Do you read? Luckily, someone accepted his request when he was about to run away. Butcher 1 to Rocket Battalion. Monitoring offer. 35 Ankies, 4 Magnas and 2 Megano Drakes. Roger that coordinates. Copy break. While the radio was on, he read a complicated military map. He scribbled on it using a kind of square ruler, and occasionally peered through Barrett's scope. The time was ticking. He had to get a pinpoint location before the targets moved away. Sierra Mike Delta, 23040321, 25320348, Alpha Mike Delta Mike. Understood. Package will be sent. Find any shelter. Over. First Rocket Artillery Battalion, Army Strategic Reserve. Target confirmed. SS-400 Hetem is ready to launch. Engage. 30 miles away from the battlefield, six Brazilian-made Tectron trucks lined up on the hill. They were being used as Astro's two MK-6 platforms, the most powerful MRS in the Indonesian military. A launching tube turned slowly to follow the computerized ballistic calculation. The radar antenna was spinning on the AVUC platform among the target pinpointing processes, gaining real-time picture on monster's exact location by a drone. A Tektron's tube launched a rocket as soon as the commander gave the order. Fire! A burst of smoke erupted when a threadle-sized rocket shot quickly into the sky. Traveling fast at Mach 0.8, it arrived in just a matter of minutes. A horde of monsters would never know what disaster was approaching. The rocket flew precisely in the middle of the pack, soaring in air temperature when the warhead kissed the ground. Tons of flammable chemical fuel had been released. A second later, the explosion sucked oxygen up into deadly thermoblast zone. Kaboom! Entire rock monsters were gruesomely massacred. Their bodies were cooked alive from inside by the wide scale of thermobaric effects. Several ankylodrakes were swept away like dry leaves in autumn. Their lung were ruptured. Some of them were torn to shreds after being hit by steel fragments traveling at three times the speed of sound. The shockwave alone could be felt from miles away. The dome guy, meanwhile, kept his head away while tapping on the radio. Direct target destroyed. 4. Chapter 1. Tales of the Prince. Chapter 1. Tales of the Prince. Once upon a time, in the palace of the World Tree, a brave king was in mourning. Oh, Yggdrasil, why have you forsaken us? Why did you take my son? A thin man lay lifeless on a rattan bed. The crown prince was dying. The Laura kingdom faced a bitter future. At 114 years old, the prince was too young to meet his demise. The king had to do something. Oh, your majesty, what should we do? Our kingdom will be doomed without a successor. We have no choice. Summon the witch. The elders were taken aback. But they had no choice either. Valora kingdom was in such a thin spot that he chose the worst option. Not long after, the most powerful witch on the entire continent arrived. She was the only hope for the kingdom to survive. Twenty thousand years of history must be preserved. The prince had to be resurrected. But it won't be easy, said the witch. Bringing the dead back to life is beyond taboo. This ceremony is forbidden by Yggdrasil. I could permanently lose most of my prana after ceremony. I'll pay with anything. Bring the prince back. Are you sure? Yes. I'd rather be a sinner for the sake of Valora. The evil witch grinned. She was willing to perform the ceremony with outrageous condition. The king was surprised. The condition was impossible for him to fulfill. 
That's more taboo than bringing the dead back to life. Have you gone mad? Yggdrasil will not approve it. I'm a cursed child, my king. 234 years of my life are taboo in Yggdrasil's eyes. Have you forgotten who I am? You want to make my son an evil like you? Yes. Valora don't need a pacifist king like you. We need the ruthless one. I will share my soul to this child. And you have to exile him to their world. The king was enraged. He knew that the witch exploited his mourning as an opportunity to seek revenge. And the revenge was directed the heroes of the gods, a group of humans from another world. The witch hated them to the bone. Ironically, the heroes of the gods came from a world without faith. Their appearance completely resembled that of the human race. But their attitude was more disgusting. They didn't know what honor was, lived in hypocrisy, and considered the civilizations of this world as toys. They exploited the power of the gods to invade. The heroes created nothing but destruction. Even the king knew that his son had been poisoned. You may call me evil, my king, but you know who the real evils are. They are chosen by the gods. If the gods insisted on protecting the heroes, I would rather fight the god. Accept the terms, your majesty. You have no choice. The king was forced to accept. In the end, he went through the ceremony, which turned out to be quite heinous. The crown prince had been resurrected. He opened his beautiful green eyes and recognized his father's tears. I'm alive. Yes, my son, you're alive. The entire kingdom of Valora was filled with joy. They celebrated the survival of their history as the prince got his second chance. Of course, the witch attended the ceremony. She drank the wine with an evil smirk. Only the king who realized that the wicked witch had planned something sinister. Varg, are you still my son? Yes, I am. Oh, my father. The king rubbed his face. Not even a month after the prince's resurrection, he became someone else. The naive and kind prince was gone. He now loved to swear, was easily angered, and didn't give a damn about sacred tradition. To make matters worse, the prince kept doing embarrassing things every night. Why did you do that? Do what? I give you fourteen young virgins as your servants. And you slept with Estio? She is older than your grandma. I don't like virgin. Their holes are too small for my ding-dong. And their tits are flat like shit. Oh, Yggdrasil. Forgive my son. The Valoran was indeed graced with a long life and a beautiful appearance. Even Estio, the prince's nanny, remained beautiful in her past four hundred years. Everything about Valoran was a work of art, especially their noble attitude. However, the prince had turned into an uncivilized savage. Even his physique was more like that of a barbarian than a beautiful Valoran. The king was so embarrassed that he accepted that his son was a disgrace. I have no choice. You need to be exiled. Where? Armin Kingdom? You let me blend among big-breasted human females? No. Beyond that, I will send you to the world behind the portal. That was how his new life had started. The king fulfilled the witch's condition to exile his son to earth. He was obliged to learn about their civilization, which was beyond advanced. Especially their military power. It said that they could repel a demonic invasion easily. Their defense technology was more than lethal. And that is why the witch insisted on sending the prince. While the heroes were graced with magic, the prince learned firearms from their world. Of course, passing through the portal was taboo for native ethereal beings. They could lose their connection to the gods. However, the witch had done her job to make it happen. She erased some part of the prince's memory and installed the new one. She even cut off his ears to make him look like a human. Military exchange had begun. Six years later, the price became an elite soldier in the most notorious unit. Direct. Target destroyed, said the prince amidst the shockwave. Flakes of flesh fell like rain with dust and a barbecue smell. The blast radius covered a hectare and burned everything around it, showing how good the SS-150 HET Mage was for a mere $800,000 rocket. The destruction was too severe. Nevertheless, the vacuum bomb had a drawback that made the prince can't see a thing. The dust was too thick. Butcher 1, give me the situation. Are you copy? Half of target have been neutralized. Half? One Megan is barely breathing. He answered while looking at binoculars. Half of its body is torn apart, and one of its eyes has been destroyed. Other monsters? Questioning their live meaning. There was silence for a moment. Examining his bag, the prince found two BMG remaining. His decision had been made. He loaded them all into Barrett's M82, and bang, Meganadrake floundered in pain. Its remaining eye had been shot. He fired a second round to make sure it was blind. 
Butcher 1, what the hell are you doing? Pest control, stay on your position. Don't do anything stupid. Negative, they are sitting ducks. He answered firmly while reloading the remaining slugs at Keltec. Putting the shotgun on his back, the elite soldier grabbed a tactical machete. Radioactivity not yet declining on your sight. Wait for reinforcement. Varg didn't answer immediately. He looked up in the sky and found a NAS-322 Super Puma, a large helicopter with various communication devices. It was from there that the female captain led his operation. Marine Cavalry Brigade is about to arrive. Stay down, Sergeant. Back to your position. The elite soldier didn't care anymore. He took everything from his bag and ran toward the monsters. It was the only chance to take all the credit. Some ankylodrakes had been disoriented, while others were paralyzed by the blast. Killing them was a walk in the park. Jackalvard del Valora, back to your position. She mentioned his name. Pip, there was no longer any conversation after he said. Over. Varg slashed the monster's necks over and over. The machete was glowing blue when his visor were glowing green. There was some kind of magical property or something. Despite the fact that monster's skin was thick, especially around their neck bones, he chopped them off like nothing. All the monsters died like dairy animals in the butcher's shop. Except for Meganadrake, of course. Varg wasn't stupid enough to approach the huge lizard. He knew well what the 56-meter-long monster could do when it returned to its senses. It turned out that it had a Jacobson organ just like a reptile, so it was able to sense heat signatures even though the eyes were totally blind. Threatened by a single soldier, it spit blobs of corrosive fire as big as a family car. Wrong move, Gecko. Varg's body heat completely disappeared when the surrounding area was on fire. Hiding behind a monster's carcass, the green lights on his visor were glowing brighter. He could scan monster's anatomy somehow. It turned out that the weakness was under the neck, which was merely protected by three layers of scales, each 20 millimeters thick, which could be countered by 12 gauges from the point blank. He took the Keltec and cocked it slowly. Crack. A big tree broke in half with a single flick of the tail. Meganadrake went berserk. It was frustrated as its eyes and Jacobson organ were completely disabled. Fireballs fell everywhere like meteor fragments in doomsday movies. The duel escalated to its peak. Meganadrake confused when the dome soldier threw something into its mouth. Surprise, son of Abich! Boom! No matter how big the monster was, white phosphorus grenade brought a hell. It burned Megan's mouth to the bone and seep into bloodstream. It was hurt a lot that Meganadrake lost its power to lift its own head. The big lizard entered the strike zone. As the head got lower, Varg jumped below its neck and fired the shotgun shells. Bam! Bomb! First shot, second shot, third shot. And eight shots later, its lower scales fell off. The wound was deep enough to plant something inside. However, the chance had gone. The monster realized that there was a hole in its neck. The burning pain in its mouth had subsided. Varg moved away when the monster beyond berserk. Damn it! Rubbing the carrier vest, he took the C4. The plastic explosive was a last resort to kill the big gecko. However, Meganadrake had lost its sense. It swung its tail and spat fire randomly. The battleground became chaotic. Varg climbed the carcass of a stone monster to get its attention. Over here, chubby cold-blooded bitch. Wanna bury my ass, huh? Here. Go get my ass. Meganadrake stopped struggling. The creature approached Magnetara's corpse, where a crazy human swore at it. Varg clapped his hand to generate vibrations for Megan to receive. His location was exposed. He took a stance when Megan was running wild to eat him alive. Nice, baby. Come to Papa. Do or die. His adrenaline pumped up. The Valoran prince jumped off Magnetara's corpse, grabbing the giant lizard's scar and dangling like a monkey. He then took the explosives that had been connected to a timer detonator. Meganadrake kept swinging its head as its neck was being fisted. The C4 had been inserted. Varg jumped off while showing off two middle fingers. Happy birthday! Boom! One explosion determined everything. Dust spread when a gigantic lizard fell down with a huge hole in its neck. Varg was knocked over by the shockwave, and both ears kept ringing. The green light on his visor was no more. Bleeding so badly, he crawled away to a safer place. Boother 1, how you copy? Solid cough. Are you wounded? Never feel better. Radioactivity is not over yet. Move away. If I could, ma'am. Fresh blood was flowing out of his mask. He must have had an internal injury, while his right foot seemed to be broken. 
The portal had not disappeared, nevertheless. It released dozens of fresh monsters from another world. There was nothing he could do. Varg lay down exhaustingly amidst the smoke and dust from the last battle. Third Platoon 1st Marine Cavalry Brigade is about to arrive. I can see it. Varg glanced at the cloud of dust approaching. Move over! You're too close to the strike zone. The elite soldier took a random stick to help him stand. Even walking was challenging. He moved away slowly when dozens of large monsters crawl out of the dome. Take your gun. Oh, come on. Every single bullet you shot is counted, pretty boy. We're tight asked. He walked hastily to grab the Keltec KSG that he had thrown away. Luckily, the expensive weapon had not been damaged. He even hopping like a one-legged rabbit when he saw several marines set the mortar. Some PT-76 amphibious tank approached. The time was ticking. Congratulations, pretty boy. You are now a full-pledged dome operator. Enjoy your privilege. Boom. 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 A series of explosions rumbled behind him. Varg walked casually, not far from Mortar Salvos. Several cannon shells from the Marines' cavalry brigade passed him. The remaining monster was being killed. Reinforcements had arrived. However, several Marines pretended to be blind when they saw what unit the prince was. They didn't even salute him or help him walk. The privilege was too good. I feel like a black guy in Arkansas. Don't mind it, sergeant. From now on, you're not allowed to show your face in dome uniforms. I know, I'm too handsome to show off, ma'am. How about a date? Negative. Stop flirting and move your ass. Varg walked like a beggar with a stick among regular soldiers. His unit was so notorious that he had to fight alone. The detachment of monster eradication was the epitome of the new military doctrine. They served under the Ministry of Defense and were watched by United Nations Ethereal Management and Security. Their relationship with the army was like that of the Waffen-SS and Wehrmacht. Ignoring their tendency, Varg looked at a Boeing CH-47 Chinook, which was painted all black. Boother 1, this is Command Center. Any report, boy? Someone radioed. Mission accomplished. Any issue? Negative, Lieutenant Colonel. Out here. The twin-bladed helicopter descended to pick him up. Looking at the monster's skull logo on its body, the Black Chinook was a special transport for dome unit. Two masked soldiers went out, the door and formed a perimeter. One more came out to help him walk to the back door. Putting off his mask, he revealed a handsome face and a pair of beautiful green eyes. Oh, Yggdrasil, my life and death are for you. He prayed in silence. 4. Chapter 2. Common Enemy. Announcement. Hello? This story has been published before. There are 43 chapters in the old version. However, after receiving reader suggestions, I revised it to make it better. Please don't hesitate to comment. While there are not many chapters. Thanks. Chapter 2. Common Enemy. The Red Zone. Sector 3. Viewers, Surabaya City is paralyzed after experiencing the portal break. 230,000 civilians were killed. Material losses are estimated to have exceeded tens of billions of dollars. The United Nations stated that the disaster was the biggest portal break in 25 years. Three weeks after the war, all TV stations aired similar news. There was a report from a journalist every hour and a headline every minute. The death toll was too big to be ignored. 230,000, ten times the number of Valoran. Listening the news, a muscular, 189 tall man shaved his hair. Six feet two inches. Small threads of new grown silver hair fell into the sink. The color was too striking. So did his emerald pupils. Turning off the electric shaver, he covered the undercut with black polish and his pupils with contact lenses. He lived his life as a human. Boss, it's party time. Hurry up. Someone knocked the door. Yeah, give me five minutes. Varg left the bathroom shirtless. His look was so attractive even though his face was tainted with scars. His upper body was also decorated with horrible scars that made everyone wonder if he had been hit by a train or something, not to mention the tribal tattoos that resembled animal silhouettes. Accompanying his colleagues, he grabbed a beer can and gave them all ears. You know what? Tommy died. What? How come? He saved civilians when transporting ammunition. Well, 5.56 millimeters do nothing again, Enki. At least he died as a hero. Someone lit AC-4 on a bonfire. The meat was ready to be grilled. Varg didn't talk much among old friends on his previous unit. He sat silently while hearing their gloomy stories. The last portal break had taken so many lives. 
I heard that a platoon of combat reconnaissance encountered a dragon. They were wiped out. Yeah, I heard that too. No one survived. I thought our boss was one of the victims. Varg smiled calmly when their attention turned toward him. Nah, they are from 501 Infantry Brigade. He waved. I fought on different portal. On paper, Varg joined combat reconnaissance, strategic reserve. In reality, he served as the operator of the detachment of monster eradication. His military career was kept in the dark. He faced life and death situations in every duty. However, in his free time, he always visited the fourth supply and transportation's barracks. There were several humans he considered brothers. Sometimes they smuggled alcohol, sometimes they picked random women on the way, and sometimes they stole monster meat from the dismantling facility. Every day was a party, and the party was ruined when someone pointed at the TV. Dude, look at this asshole. What's going on? They do it again. All the soldiers were furious. They watched TV with their teeth chattering in anger. Of course, since all the local stations were owned by politicians, there was always talk of political debates whose content was pure nonsense. Tonight we invited a military observer. He will explain what happened yesterday from his perspective as an expert. We invite you to the time and place. A fat man had some difficulty shaking hands with the presenter. His chair didn't fit his wide buttocks no matter how everyone looked at him. The military expert had never done a single push-up. His breathing was labored as he spoke after munching on a pack of donuts. The real heroes are Walker. If they could use their power on Earth, there would have been no portal break, and we wouldn't need the armed force. The military are useless anyway. What is the basis for your opinion? The presenter asked. Have you ever read any Hunter Mama? That's the proof, and I'm an expert. While the fat man was talking out of his ass, everyone was nodding, as they bought his words seriously, except for the group of participants wearing military uniforms. They were officers from the armed forces. Their faces were red because the fat man kept spouting bullshit. You are a military expert, aren't you? Have you ever held a grenade? One of the officers started asking questions when allowed by the panelists. Obviously. How do they work? Hmm, the grenade is planted in the ground. Some people stifled laughter. The TV presenter quickly switched off the mic as the expert answered incorrectly. We'll continue the conversation after commercial. Bam. The debate was over when someone punched the TV. As Haluli, is this what we get? I hate politician. I hate Walker. Varg smiled bitterly when his friends went insane. After fighting life and death, not even, thanks you, they get. The discrimination was real that they kept yelling and swearing. Until suddenly, a private entered the room with his breath caught in his throat. What? Officer incoming. Shit! The soldiers hurriedly hid their beers and cigars. Some of them pretended to sweep the floor, while others were doing push-ups. The barracks became hectic. They acted like good boys when a 37-year-old female captain opened the door. Well, 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 I can smell alcohol from miles away. The boys immediately fell silent. They stood firmly, like proper military guys when the captain gave them a cold glance. Alcohol was a big no-no for the Indonesian armed forces, not to mention the monster meats that were obviously stolen stuff. All of them tried their best to hold their breath. Luckily, the Red Beret officer didn't come for an inspection. She came for a handsome man with scars and tattoos. Dressed up, pretty boy. We need to talk. A date, ma'am? The fierce-looking captain rolled her eyes. Chief of National Intelligence Agency want to meet you. The Red Zone was a military facility to mitigate dimensional threats. Its protocols were strict, with armed forces loitering around. There were dozens of companies from various units, the equivalent of two battalions. The Surabaya Red Zone, in particular, was a massive structure that covered more than 50,000 hectares of land. The area was divided into four segments that looked like a multilayered ring, almost similar to the city of man-eating giants in popular anime. Attack on giants or whatever? I haven't met Lieutenant Colonel lately. Where is he? Court-martialed. What? Why? Swearing at the House of Representative and threatened a walker. PFFFTT. He has never changed. Varg couldn't help but giggle. Strolling down Sector 3, the young prince couldn't shake his glance at a 37-year-old female captain's buttocks. A faint sign of affection could be seen in his eyes. Human ladies were amazing, particularly women in their 30s and 50s. The captain's well-shaped boobs and asses were a real work of art. Varg's green pupils automatically glowed whenever he saw they booshed. Pray for Yggdrasil. 
The investigation was forced to stop. Portal break? He changed his gaze to a random object when the captain turned at him. Yes. Someone up there didn't want it touched. Walker? Who else? The female captain looked sad while walking. She turned her eyes to a hero's grave, where the soil was still wet. 3,178 armed forces personnel have died, mostly from the red zone, and we didn't have any right to find out what was going on. We need your help. I'm in. You should. Varg tried his best to keep his cool. The word, Walker, always got on his nerves. Who the heck are they? Walker was the official name for a bunch of chosen humans who were able to pass through the portal. In Varg's world, they had different names. Ethereal inhabitants called them the heroes of gods. Yes, they were Valoran enemies who brought disaster to his world. Surprisingly, they also made trouble on Earth. They have political power, money, and public influence that even presidents don't dare touch. They aren't random kids who claim themselves as chosen humans with power systems. Power system? They are just a bunch of grown adults with severe middle grade syndrome. The female officer giggled. The longer you're on Earth, the more human-like you become. She stopped for a while and asked Varg to get closer. Are you really an otherworldly being? No doubt. The female captain raised an eyebrow. She stood closer, examining the prince's face with curiosity. Don't get any closer, ma'am. I can't hold myself against the beauty like you. What a smooth talker. Not as smooth as your lips. May I have it? Varg was so attractive that every woman had a hard time holding herself, including the captain. The prince's flirting skills multiplied his handsome looks. The female officer returned to her senses when her lips were about to get kissed. Is every male elven a womanizer like you? Negative, ma'am. The elf is a disgustingly romantic creature. We have been loyal to our spouses for hundreds of years. Loyal, my ass. I lost count of how many women you brought to the bed. Well, I can't help it. The captain smiled awkwardly when their conversation headed in a weird direction. She kept walking until they arrived at the official residence. A middle-aged man in black was waiting for them. He was the chief of the Indonesian State Intelligence Agency, a heavy smoker, and a man of culture. Welcome, your highness Jackal Vard del Valora. Bowing, he put his hand on his chest like a noble from European middle age. Counseling time, an elven prince sat relaxedly on a sofa cushion. The chief of the Indonesian National Agency, on the other side, sat casually on the edge of the table. His lips were full of smirks. Lighting a clove cigar, he asked questions in a friendly manner. I can't see any difference between us, your highness, especially your knowledge. It's almost impossible for you to think like an earthling in the short time. You're like someone who was born here. What was going on? Magic. Someone has installed Earth's common sense and basic knowledge here. Varg tapped his own head. That ain't how you got your identity as an earthling? Yes. Varg's statement was so firm and clear that the chief kept nodding. Well, the National Intelligence Agency was aware of your identity six years ago, right after you came to Earth. We did surveillance for five years. We knew that you would learn about our civilization, and even let you join the military in a regular way. So, that's why you guys exploit me, huh? The chief laughed amusedly. We called it symbiotic mutualism, my prince. Your kingdom got what you wanted, and my country benefited. We even took care of the 376 women you slept with. Unluckily, no one pregnant. Unluckily? I mean luckily. Please don't imagine something wild. We won't take your offspring as an experimental subject. Was scary. That was how the womanizer prince stopped sleeping with random ladies. Varg was irritated that chose to cut the phrase. All right, let's stop beating around the bush. What do you want? The man in black didn't answer immediately. He handed over a document for the prince to read. The content was pleasing. Varg threw away his defensive attitude and acted cooperatively. Finally, you did the right thing. Yes, you will be granted Indonesian citizenship. To be precise, dual citizenship with the United States. No need to hide anymore. Condition? The chief moved his eyebrows up and down. His smile like a kid watched his friend dating. Marry her. Um, you know? A beautiful 41-year-old Brazilian lady. Varg got annoyed when one of his girlfriends was mentioned. The Brazilian lady was the most important business partner for the Indonesian armed forces, as well as the best candidate for his queen on earth. Varg nodded. He had a plan to marry her anyway. Second condition? Reevaluate your career in detachment of monster eradication. The prince smiled widely. The condition was too good. 
Actually, he never intended or was willing to join the most hated unit in the world. The United Nations strictly prohibited firearm access to ethereal inhabitants, not to mention joining the military, except for the detachment of monster eradication. In a sense, reevaluating his membership sounded like it would bring more freedom. Giving firearms to non-human beings is a controversial decision. To make matters worse, your gear is more advanced than that of the regular military branch. You guys were treated as PMCs though. You're heavily watched and have no right under the Geneva Convention. What will happen if the Dome Guy revolts? They are dangerous. What should I do? The government is asking for your stand. Being a human or an elf, you need to be firm. There was a silence for a moment. The time had come. Varg knew that his background as a backdoor immigrant would be questioned. Moreover, the chief rubbed his pocket and showed an ID card. The walker named Sepmadiki was declared dead eight years ago. Tell me what was going on. What happened to him? And why are you using his identity? Resurrection. Bring back the dead? Yes. The man in black squinted. The answer was too hard to comprehend. For the sake of his freedom, Varg explained it with the shortest words. I got his body and some portion of his memory. You killed him? No, both of us have died. It was the confusion of the highest order. The chief listened in disbelief when the prince told how he was brought back from the dead. He didn't lie about having two bodies and minds. By combining the corpse of a walker, the witch had successfully fooled the gods. Varg could easily pass through the portal. He also fooled the Indonesian government with his legitimate human profile. Have you ever been in, well, internal conflict? No. Because we have a common enemy. Who? Walker. We were both murdered by a walker. The office room became a misty forest when a middle-aged man blew a cloud of smoke. In the 25 years since the new era began, humanity has witnessed so many unexplainable things. Monsters, interdimensional portals, energy crystal, and chosen humans with magic power. Modern knowledge has evolved. However, bringing back the dead was out of the question. Well, let's forget about it. He lit a new cigar while the previous one was halfway done. We are investigating Walker's involvement in the portal break. I know we can't accurately determine it with unscientific reason, but we need your cooperation, Varg squinted. Reading another document, he realized that the National Intelligence Agency wasn't playing around. They did their homework about the portal break that destroyed half of the city. Is it possible to deliberately send monsters from another world? The chief asked. Yes. Walkers are categorized into several classes. Each is blessed by a god. One of them is Janus, the god of gatekeepers. The mage with Janus' blessings has ability to open a portal from ethereal to earth. To send Walker back? Yes. And send Monster here. The chief's expression was less confused than when he heard Resurrection. As if he already knew that the Walker was the one responsible for 230,000 civilian victims and 3,000 armed forces casualties. The disaster wasn't a natural phenomenon, which everyone was forced to believe. And I did sense mana anomalies on the battlefield. They were Janus mana. Varg added more legit intel. Squinting his eyes, he firmly asked the real question. Why did they do that? I know you already have the information. The air became heavier. Both of them had tensed faces. In the end, the chief of the National Intelligence Agency disclosed the confidential information. They waged war. We received legit intel from a walker who was involved in this accident. Walkers have gathered hundreds of thousands of native army to destroy. Destroy what? Valora. Your kingdom. His body felt drained after hearing the news. Varg had been suspicious for a long time, but didn't think the war had happened. Especially when he read the third document on the table. It was legit. His homeland was about to be destroyed. Closing his eyes, he imagined the faces of people he loved so much. Father. Terai's. Estio. 3. Chapter 3. Power System. Chapter 3. Power System. Sector 1. The Red Zone. Several months earlier. Radioactivity is detected. Monsters? No. More annoying creatures. TSK. Sound the siren. Beep. 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 The sound of sirens alarmed the Red Zone. But all the soldiers just took a quick look, as if they hadn't heard anything at all. They ignored the siren without bothering to take up arms. Except for the supply and transportation units which were obligated to move their asses. They walked reluctantly with an annoyed look on their faces. Shit! Here we go again. How many assholes will come out? Around 70. The old trucks started up. And all were equipped with closed covers without any windows. 
except on the subject of ventilation. Arriving at Sector 1, the drivers showed expressions like they were taking a dump with no tissue. Damn it, I'm sick of this. Chill out. This is part of the job. They parked the truck in front of a strange 700-foot tower, 200 meters. The structure was somehow a bit like the Pisa Tower in Rome, but a couple times bigger in scale. The architecture was exactly the same as a European-style tower with pillars and gates. A black dome with bright edges emerged. The soldiers shut their mouths when they saw several people in medieval outfits. How many stuffs you carrying? Exiting the portal, a nerd-looking guy with chainmail chatted leisurely. Maybe 1500 grade F crystals and 70 slot coins. The chainmail guy started counting. He frowned in surprise as he did the math. Are you serious? The crystal alone is only worth $43,000, while the coins are $21,500. Your monthly income is not even $65,000. You know what? I brought 2,800 grade F crystals and 140 slot coins. What else can I do? I rarely hunt, you know? I was busy sightseeing Crocosila City. TSK, what a slacker. While the walkers were casually talking, some supply and transportation soldiers reluctantly loaded their belongings. The work was so hard because they were not being paid. The soldiers talked to each other with a low voice, as if they were afraid their words could be heard. It's really good to be a walker, huh? My annual salary not even a half their weekly income. Yeah, how long can we be their slave? That's how the walker was a natural moneymaker. And a natural moneymaker would always get the best treatment. Dozens of them sat on the passenger seats to travel 13 kilometers from sector 1 to the exit, acting like honorable nobles to commoners. They were also facilitated with a separate waiting tent as well as a parking lot for rows of luxury cars. Walkers were kings with their money. The soldiers, meanwhile, could only bite their fingers. Comparing their small salaries to walkers' earnings would always bring a tear. Ugh hi. I'm not jealous, sob. I'm not fucking jealous. Walker Academy. Walker Association HQ. All walkers were represented by an organization called the Walker Association. That's where their goods were exchanged for money. Primarily the crystals they got from the other world. They were loaded as hell. Walker and poverty would never be mentioned in the same sentence. Definitely, as money makers, they also need a special education. So, in these six months, you only learn theory. Learning the basics of being a walker. You must understand each other's talents as well as learn the culture and language of Ethereal. We'll provide everything for education. Since the portal in Indonesia is connected to the Armand Kingdom, you'll learn their language and the surrounding area. A man stood calmly in front of teenagers dressed in the style of medieval European nobles. They looked like teachers and students. Obviously they were. The association was supposed to provide the walkers with any education they needed before entering the other world. Are you ready to be a walker? Yes, sir. They walked through a round garden that was about 110 yards in diameter, 100 meters. The park was surrounded by European-style buildings and all their accents. So majestic. No one would have ever guessed that the academy was located in the second largest city in Indonesia. Wow, is that the entrance? A student pointed to the tower in the center of the garden. Yes. You enter ethereal through that tower. But the exit is through the red zone. Whoa! The students gaped in unison. The association's tower had similarities to the red zones. It was just smaller, about a tenth of it. The tower also had a portal dome that was always open 24 hours a day. That's where the walkers entered another world. Are only walkers allowed? What if a normal human tried to enter? They would be rejected. Ethereal only accepts things that originate there. They continued walking towards the tower. The instructor took a pen and inserted his hand into the dome, just to show how it worked. As a result, the pen bounced off. Ethereal doesn't accept anything from Earth. You can't bring cell phones, toys, or anything else into that world. Even your clothes will bounce off. We will get naked? Ha ha. The boys burst out laughing, while the girls were embarrassed. Don't worry, the association provides clothing and weapons for beginners. All of these items can enter the portal because they originated from Ethereal. The female student breathed a sigh of relief, while the male student looked disappointed. A boy would always be a boy. They seem to not mind getting naked though. I heard that ethereal clothes are expensive. Someone asked innocently. A classic question. Yes. The price is expensive. $150,000 at the most. And it's just for the cheapest pair of clothes. Not to mention your weapons and all the tuition fees. It will be millions of dollars. 
but don't worry, you don't need to be paid now, but later, after you become a walker, and the interest rate is only 10% per month, while the teacher was acting like an experienced insurance agent, the students cheerfully looked at each other, they didn't even mind that the tuition loan was more gruesome than the bank, whatever, all they needed was adventure in a world with game-like experiences, will we be able to see status board, a male student asked, followed by other kids' sparkling eyes. Is there a power system like in MMORPGs? The teacher snapped his fingers as he was satisfied with the questions. It was better than talking about terms, conditions, finance, and all other things that only adults would understand. The boys, in particular, were always enthusiastic about the system thingy and the status board. Later, when you first enter the portal, you will be asked to set a stat. Everyone is equal. Each of you will be given a beginner crystal, which contains 80 points of stats. And there will be four basic stats. They are physicality, perception, magic power, and charisma. You are free to distribute the 80 points wherever you like, as long as it is relevant to the talent. And as long as physical ability and perception have 10 points. Do you know why? The students turned to each other. No one was able to answer. The teacher answered himself as the students got more and more confused. 10 points is the standard for a normal, healthy human. You should not reduce that stat. Put an average of 10 points in those two stats first. If you are a vanguard fighter, put more emphasis on physicality or perception. If you're a mage, focus more on magic power. Just like everyday RPG game, or whatever you read on the internet. Then we can be stronger than normal humans? Indeed. If you have 20 physical points, that means your strength is twice that of a normal human. Aren't you interested? Stronger than normal human? Those simple sentences immediately drove the student's enthusiasm. The teenage male always dreamed of easy strength and being overpowered overnight, like in fantasy stories they had always read. Whether it was a cheat skill or putting a number on the status board, being golden spoon was so tempting. Do we still get more points later? One of the boys asked hurriedly with sparkling eyes. Yes. You will get four extra points every time you level up. Woah! While walking in the park, the teacher kept explaining basic stuff to the students. Their number wasn't large. The new awakening in Indonesia didn't even reach 300 people per year. And there were only 10 walker academies throughout Indonesia to accommodate their education needs. So exclusive. It said that only one of the 3,000 people had been chosen to be a walker. Teacher, it said we can also change our appearance in another world? Asked a girl. The teacher smiled broadly at a question he had heard so many times. Yes. That's why there's the charisma stat. Your physique will change to be more ideal. And your face will be optimized according to the value of charisma. Just like the face filters on social media apps. So don't be afraid, girls. There are no ugly walkers in ethereal. Kaya! The girls immediately lost their sanity. As soon as the teacher finished explaining, a group of people dressed in medieval style appeared. They also carried ancient weaponry like swords, shields, arrows, wands, everyone name it. The teacher explained while pointing at the group. They are second semester students. In that semester, you will immediately practice in another world. You will learn to fight for the combat type walker. Or learn commerce for production and service walkers. You will be guided by instructors until you reach level 10. You already know the rank order, don't you? All students nodded, clearly understanding the homework. There was a ranking system for a walker's power based on their level. Let's say they were beginner walkers. They would always start at rank and go up every 10 levels. They would enter Frank when they reached level 11, a rank at level 21, and so on. The good news was that leveling up was quite easy. They only needed to hunt monsters or make items for production classes. There was no need for physical exercise. All they had to do was punch in the numbers. There was also no need to practice any combat skills because the system would provide everything. Easy, wasn't it? The question was, what the hell were second semester students doing in another world? Ethereal, the world behind the portal. Keep it in mind, kids. This is not Earth. No wandering around without any instructor. Got it? Yes, Mr. Instructor. With every breath they took, their eyes closed tightly. Their lips smiled brightly at the freshness of another world's atmosphere. The sky was bright purple. It was refracting the warm light of the blue sun, not the yellow sun they used to see. Blue and red moons danced above the clear sky of ethereal. Oh my god! It's so beautiful. Students' eyes were glittering in amazement at the world before their eyes. Attention kids! 
a man in medieval armor was keeping an eye on dozens of novice walkers. Everyone was still awkward. Their mouths were gaping wide at the nature around them. It was their first time, after all. The instructor carried on to speak while his assistant distributed something. Those crystals will give you 80 points of stats. It's only works to walker with zero experience point. Open your status board and use it immediately. In no time, all students did the same thing. Whoa! I can really open the status board. It's like a game. Woola lulialu. Quickly, put the crystal on. The instructor waited for the kids to finish their things. Students became noisy as they examined the status board. Some tried to feel it, and others looked around the back. All of them were amazed as they inserted the strange crystal. Do you see? There are four stats on the status board. Only physicality and perception have numbers. The rest are zero, because the numbers are your innate strength from Earth. It's between five and ten, sometimes more if you're very healthy. Wow, my physical is only six, and perception is only five. I just realized that I'm so weak on Earth. Continued a chubby student in yellow robe. Whoa, I got seven. Cough. The instructor cleared his throat as the student noisy again. You have put the crystal on, haven't you? Use those points on the four stats according to your talent. Balance it well. Don't put too much point on one stat. Use voice commands to distribute them all. As soon as they put the stats in, the students got hysterical. They could notice the differences right away on their looks. Physical stats immediately gave them muscles and body height. Charisma stat, in other hand, gave them completely different appeals. Their face became charming. The system worked like magic. In the end, all the students were eager to put up points at will. Wow, you're so handsome. You've also become handsome and taller. Let's put more on charisma. The instructors let out a long sigh. They were used to this situation. Beginner walkers usually put too much emphasis on charisma, especially female walkers. They wanted to be beautiful without effort, as if they were tired of being potatoes in the real world. One of them even passed out after she saw her own face, which resembled that of a popular TikTok celeb. Oh my, I'm slim. My skin is so smooth and bright. My face become gorgeous. Kaya. This time, the instructor sat squatting in the corner. It was impossible for his words to be noticed by the students. The customization part always drove the girls to insanity. Appearance was everything for female students. Some of them did the hair, colored it, got tattoos, changed the pupil color, and even sacrificed their points to enlarge their chests. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god! My boobs are so hot. The girls hysterically squeezed their own breasts without realizing the boys were watching. I'm in heaven. Dude, your nose is bleeding. The male students didn't care too much about their appearances. They were satisfied enough with the strong-looking muscle and their new body height. The only appearance they cared about was their hairstyles. They remodeled them to look like an ice guy protagonist with shaped or spiky long hair. So cool. The instructor impatiently spoke up after two hours of waiting for them. Form a party immediately. Next session is hunting practice. Learn how to fight. In the beautiful garden-like field, twelve students divided their group into three parties. All of them were accompanied by an instructor for safety. The adventure had begun. They could not wait to fight monster like in the game. However, reality kicked in. Students had tense faces when they saw the real monster waiting. The game and reality were completely different. They fidgeted when the instructor pointed to a duck-like creature. That monster is Carnaduck. They are Grank monsters. Their strength is only four times that of normal ducks on Earth. Each party must kill four of them. The duck was four feet, one meter tall. It was so ugly that the students wondered what command prompt someone had written on AI generator. All teenagers were nervous. They were a bit afraid to approach it, even though four people were obligated to fight one. Their bodies trembled as the duck turned its head. Quack? Oh my god! They are even uglier than avocados. The duck became agitated. Vanguard, hold that duck, or injure it if you can. Rearguard, help the vanguard with your arrows or magic. The task was supposed to be easy. The walker was stronger than a normal human and equipped with magical skills. Still, they were just teenagers who either exercised nor even hit anyone, not to mention killing something. The parties became hysterical when they realized that the duck had creepy-looking saw teeth. Quack, quack, mommy, I'm scared. I wanna go home. You wa. The hero wannabes ran for their lives. Don't run. Use your skills. The instructor shouted in hurry. The battlefield became hectic. 
swordsmen slashed out their swords in fear while the shielder ran away without looking back. On the other side, the archers closed their eyes when they shot their arrows. Some projectiles missed, and some ended in friendly fire. The duck laughed loud. To make matters worse, the mage blindly cast and threw everything into chaos. You wah! My ass is on fire! Quack! Mommy! 2. Chapter 4. A Bitter Truth. Chapter 4. A Bitter Truth. Sector 1. The Red Zone. Beep! 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 A black dome emerged with pink edges that was a portal for student walkers. All soldiers maintained their distance and kept their mouths shut. There was a regulation that forced them to do so. On the other hand, the pupils left the gate with bodies that had undergone significant changes. The ideal look they had set had been lost in the haze. They all wore gloomy expressions as their appearances returned to normal. My face is ugly again, sobs. My slender body, hua. Their disappointment was real. But their misery had just begun. The students, who were previously treated with smiles, now feel pressured. They were silent in fear when the instructors showed a cold face. Don't let the public know that you are only strong in the other world. Got it? Or your membership will be revoked. Remember, association is watching you. The students fell into depression. They didn't dare speak anymore. After seeing what life was like behind the portal, Walker Academy changed their attitude. It was no longer a picnic like before. The instructor even acted like a prison warden when they took students' names. Where's Aldo? The students looked around. No one raised a finger when the name was mentioned. They just realized that out of the twelve kids, one was left behind in another world. Aldo gave his permission earlier, sir. He said he was told by his mom to stay there. A student gave an answer. Two instructors simply nodded, acting as if the situation weren't important. They continued to attend without any questioning. Some students sighed. They felt bad for expressing the fact that leaving Walker behind was not a big deal for the association. Okay kids, move up. Don't say a word. They left silently in the military truck after taking attendance, as two instructors crossed their arms to monitor their behavior. The students were not permitted to speak with the soldiers who picked them up. That regulation also applied to military personnel, who were required to keep silent until they arrived at the outer gate. Why is the association getting so mean to us? One of the students started asking as soon as he sat on the bus's seat. You don't know? Yes. We were told to keep a secret. What's going on? There were no instructors on the bus. Only second semester students were getting noisy as they discussed the strange facts after visiting the other world. You know what? History is a lie. It wasn't Walker who saved the world 25 years ago. It was military. We've seen it for ourselves, haven't we? The monsters are scary. Even after we're in the other world, we are weak. That's why the association forces us to keep our mouths shut. The atmosphere immediately tensed after their fantasies had been shattered. Being a walker was not cool at all. They felt like slaves. After knowing the bitter truth, they realized that the walker association wasn't as good as they thought. I just want to have an adventure. Why do adults make things so complicated? Somewhere in Crocosila region, Armin Kingdom. Wow, there's a servant axe. Can we hunt them now? Yeah, show time. In a tropical forest, a party of walkers were observing a swordhorn deer, an endemic species in northern side O.T. Boreella continent. The four of them acted seriously because Ethereal wasn't a game with a restart button, particularly the swordsman who appeared to be their leader. Analyzing the monster, he turned to the mage in a yellow robe. Do your job. Paralyze it. How? I'm just a beginner. The mage was a bit worried. Trust me, lightning mages are rare. That's why we invited you. The party leader turned to other members. Get into formation. All members took their positions in an RPG style. The leader was ready with a sword and a buckler, along with a spearman. The mage and an archer girl acted as rear guards behind them. They prepared to slay a creature that wasn't supposed to be their match. Oh great fulgur, bestow your grace upon me, strike my enemies with your lightning. Fulmina, flash, thud, passing through the party leader and the spearman, a flash of electricity rushed towards the monster. The effect was quite good, although the electricity was hilariously small. The deer staggered. The mage's spell gave the vanguard the opportunity to attack at the same time. Stella punctum, Falks Volnus, the monster died. See, lightning magic has a neurotic effect. Party leader proudly chuckled as his theory had been proven. Keep up, guys. They resumed their hunt after dismantling their last victim. When they encountered Servanax, 
they used a similar strategy to hunt them down. The swordsman was an excellent leader. He was well versed with the qualities of the monster, as well as the strengths and weaknesses of his squad. Wow, even the Arank party wouldn't this fast, because we have a lightning mage, ha 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 ha. While resting, they consumed some sort of potion, particularly the mage in a yellow robe. He had used up the most of his mana. Aldo, seriously you haven't graduated yet? While dismantling a carcass, the party leader asked kindly. Yes, I just entered second semester. Grank, level zero. I just visited Ethereal a couple day ago. Level zero? How come you've allowed to hunt? The archer girl joined the chat. The yellow mage exhaled deeply in a dramatic manner. Showing his attractive face, he answered the question while gazing up at the bright purple sky. My mom asked me for an expensive car like her friends. She said I'm not a good boy if I don't make more money. So, I chose to stay in Ethereal while my friends went back to Earth. His companions exchanged sidelong glances. Their expressions were all sympathetic. Surprisingly, his story was all too familiar. Yes, my mom also asked money when she found out I was a walker. My father too. How come he asked money to marry his third wife? And now, he looking for the fourth. Of course, parents weren't always angelic figures when their children made money. All of them were clearly being exploited. It was a common phenomenon among walkers. Their fate was exactly the same as how parents reacted when their children became celebrities. Squeeze them dry. Never mind, it's fun here though. Yes, I really feel at home in Ethereal. My mom told me to quit school since I became a walker. Me too. They said school is useless. Walker saw Ethereal as a realm full with delights. Its beauty could not be found on Earth, and it was too wonderful to miss. There was nothing but adventure ahead. As his party members concluded their lunch, the party head stood enthusiastically. Keep up, guys. Let's go. Woolalulialu. Adventure e. Rushes. Grail. Ho ho ho. Money honey baby. After hunting all day long, the leader showed a bag of crystals. It was their result of the hunt that would later become money. The yellow mage asked innocently while looking at the monster's crystal. Isn't it expensive? Yes. Did you see the crystal from the deer earlier? That's a grade. The price is $435 if we sell it to the association. If we sell it here, it costs 12 agar. One agar is $35. That's why it's better to sell them after we get to earth. The leader sorted through his bag again. There were hundreds of grade crystals inside it. Each of these at least $27. In a day, you can hunt hundreds. In a month, each person can bring at least 1,000 crystals. That's $27,000. Wow, we can buy a car in a month. The yellow mage became more enthusiastic. My mom will stop angry at me. Hooray, it was so easy to make money that even the novices earned thousands of dollars in a few weeks. All they had to do was go hunting. They left after that and came back with crystals to trade or with ethereal currency, which was made entirely of copper, silver, or gold. Why we leave the carcass here? We can sell it, you know? Nah, don't bother to carry it. We didn't hire a porter anyway. Just take the crystals and move up. The shade of the afternoon greeted the cheerful faces of four teenagers. The party leader still wanted to continue the hunt although they had gotten a lot. The mage felt uneasy when the leader was looking at a cave. Let's go home. My mom said not good to go out until night. This is not earth, Aldo. Take it easy, I'm experienced. Do you come here often? The swordsman responded with his chin held high. Glancing at the cavern's entrance, he spoke like a horror storyteller. This cave is the only way to Mount Dragona. That's the dragon kingdom. Bubba, hey, hey, hey. I don't want to meet dragons. Let's go home. The mage was almost crying. His colleagues burst out laughing at his reaction. All walkers were aware that dragons would not be there. It was a myth that dangerous monsters like Vellum Drakes, Ankylo Drakes, and even Megano Drakes roamed inside the cave. Dragona Cave was cool in name, but in fact, it only contained slime-like monsters, with the ranked horned wolf being the strongest. No wonder it was the most popular hunting ground for beginners. Take it easy, save our energy for tomorrow, and my sword needs to be repaired. Let's go back to the city. The party left the cave with smiles and cheers. However, the yellow mage showed a different expression. He felt uneasy. He glanced at the cave entrance as cold air seeped into his veins. Crocosila City, Armand Kingdom. Wow, their faces look like westerners. Arriving in the city, the yellow mage gaped wide to see the marvelous scene around him. Yes, 
Arman Kingdom is connected to tropical nation like Indonesia, but the people are Caucasians. The party leader answered like a tour guide. Ethereal was indeed a civilized world. It didn't only feature wildlife but also cities and kingdoms. One of them was Krakasila City, a region of the Arman Kingdom inhabited by walkers from East Java. Somehow, the natives were exactly like medieval Europeans in terms of their racial features, culture, and even architecture. The houses were so distinctive. Some were Romanesque, while others were Gothic, particularly the religious structure of the Order of Lumina, which resembled medieval Catholicism's counterpart. It feels like traveling in Europe. The yellow-robed mage was even more amazed at the splendor of the buildings around him. No wonder association's building looks like Europeans. You know what? Twenty-five years ago Ethereal wasn't this beautiful. It used to be filthy. Really? Yes. They didn't know that diseases come from germs. People used to poop everywhere. The streets smelled like shit. The lightning mage trembled when his leader pointed to the hole in the nobleman's magnificent manor. The hole was quite high and directly above the road they were walking on. That used to be a garderobe hole. It's where people take a dump, and their shits fell on the road. Whoa! What if it fell to people? The party leader laughed when the yellow mage yelled hysterically. No worries, young man. Since earthlings have been able to come here, everything has changed completely. We're very well respected by the natives. You know what they call us. What? The heroes of the gods. We are hero. Whoa! Exactly like a Japanese eye sky manga. The party leader nodded proudly when the yellow mage was even more amazed. He pointed at the archer girl, who approached from afar, with a cheer giggle on her lips. Carry on your tour with her. I'm taking my sword to the blacksmith, Krakasila's shopping district. Twenty-five years ago, before the appearance of the portal, Armand Kingdom was a small nation. But things had been different when the heroes came down from heaven. They eliminated monsters, bandits, and rebels and even helped the kingdom conquer neighboring countries. That was the brief history of Walker. Time had passed with a brand new history. The heroes blended in with the natives and became part of the kingdom. More and more of them arrived from their world and spread throughout the kingdom. Some even settled down after marrying locals. Of course, Krakasila region, a provincial equivalent region in the far north of the Armand Kingdom, was one of their second homes. 80 Arga in total. Ha! Huh. $2,875? Oh come on, that's already a discount for Walker though. The natives here have to pay one's lot. Pay it 80 Arger, or get sword repaired by yourself. What a stingy ass. The swordsman paid him curtly. He handed over his crack sword to the blacksmith, who turned out to be a walker, or hero in local terms. The swordsman was questioned with a hint of disdain after hearing the blacksmith's accent. Which person are you, Madura? Tribe in Indonesia which so good in commerce. Walker wasn't only good at fighting. Some of them were also born with talent in production. Blacksmith Walker was the best example. They were so good at their job because of the convenience of the system. The same rule was also applied to all production workers, such as cooks, walkers, painters, carvers, sewers, and so on. Their lives were so easy that some of them were even appointed to be rulers. Count Vardant was one of them. He was the ruler of Krakasila which was almost equivalent to a governor. Good job, Frederick. Ha ha. Thank you, your highness. In Krakasila Castle, a good-looking man was laughing among harem around him. They were women he had chosen from his own people. All were natives with blonde hair and blue eyes. A few more had red hair, typical features of a pure Caucasian-like medieval Europe. How many crystals are there? 276,000 crystals this month, your highness. Good, ha ha ha. Make me rich. In front of him, a tumulter tall man was kneeling. He wore a Viking helmet and was armed with a large, tubulated minotaur axe that weighed around 200 kilos. The big man smiled proudly as Count Varden praised him. This is why I love politics so much. Yes, your highness. I've learned a lot from a smart person you. For a junior walker, Ethereal was a place of adventure. On the other side, for a Nobel like Varden, it had a completely different meaning. He didn't have to spill any sweat to hunt monsters. He had soldiers to order around, and the crystals he bought from Walker and Krakasila. So easy. He could gather thousands of crystals every day without bothering to move his ass. Transport to Earth immediately. Sell them to the association. You take 5%. The big man put his hand on his chest and stood up with a smile. I will make sure to take care of all your stuffs, your highness, including tax evasion. That's my specialty. 
The Count returned to the bed after the big man left the castle. Laying down among half-naked women, his mood was so good. Being a politician was the easiest way to get power and money. He didn't even lift a finger to level up. He could easily buy an experienced potion. Sometimes he bought a special elixir to raise his stats, and he read a grimoire to get a skill. Easy. Ethereal was a pay-to-win game, after all. Count Vardant, there is a decree from Rhaenyri. Someone entered the castle with a scroll of parchment. Count Vardant immediately knelt in front of the messenger. It was a letter from the royal capital of Armin, a direct invitation from King Armin III. Vardant remained kneeling until the messenger finished reading. Count Vardant is obliged to attend the regular meeting of the two kingdoms. Go to Rhaenyri. Welcome our great guest from the kingdom of Valora. I will leave immediately. After the departure of the messenger, Vardant's face changed. His mood rose higher. The invitation was a sign of a big plan that had been done for years. His lips grinned widely when a subordinate questioned him. Is going to be a war? Yes. Time to destroy that elven bastard. 2. Chapter 5. Land of Elven. Chapter 5. Land of Elven. North side of Boreella continent. Thick tropical woods adorned a lovely scene. The morning mist gathered thickly on the tree limbs, creating a magnificent scene as if clouds were descending. In the heart of the Valoran forest, the Yggdrasil tree stood magnificently. It was massive, standing half a mile tall. The diameter of the trunk alone was tens of meters. Its branches and twigs stretched for nearly a mile. Yggdrasil was so massive that it could house a civilization, the kingdom of Valora. Your Highness, it's time to eat. Let me feed you. With a fabric tassel covering her face, a woman in a maid's outfit entered the room. She addressed the silver-haired girl who was engrossed in a book calmly. The girl was unaffected. Her delicate lips spoke softly, without turning her head. You know, Estio? They say there's no magic on earth. I don't get it. How does a smartphone work without magic? The maid sighed softly with a clear expression on her lips. Slightly pouting, she pointed to the cover of the book the princess was reading. Your Highness, how long did you read that? So what? That book is useless. The princess shifted her gaze. She showed off her emerald clear pupils and flawless skin that was free of any stains. Her long ears perked up. It had a distinct body language of being offended. Estio, this is knowledge. The maid shut her mouth. She grew accustomed to princess immature demeanor, which easily got her upset. Her highness was also prone to complaining if her interests were questioned. I want to go to Earth, Estio. I want to ride a car. I want to have a smartphone. I want to live there with him. Why did he leave me? Your Highness, please be calm. He will be back. The princess felt hesitant to respond in any way. As she sat with her arms folded, her countenance became glum. Her lovely eyes stared out the window. Pouting like a child, she mentioned someone who dared to leave her alone. Varg, where are you? Estio let out a long sigh. The princess had often mentioned someone who had been exiled to a world without magic. The veiled maid understood that Terai's missed him so much. Estio, do you miss him? Yes, your highness. Will Vard be here? Yes, your highness. Pray to Yggdrasil. Terai's mood quickly changed. Her green pupils were glittering like children. Estio exhaled with a stiff smile. She fed her patiently because the princess could not eat on her own. Estio. Yes, your highness. Can I marry him? No. He is your own brother. The princess lived in a unique room with tree-patterned walls as Valoran's royal heir. The interior design was unusually natural. All the accessories were raw-shaped. They had not been chopped or polished. The floor was covered in thick leaves, and the bed was made of some sort of webbing rattan. The drapes hung from the ceiling, and the lights were constructed of a lighted resin. Everything was lovely, in line with the gorgeous face of a childish princess. Estio, I'm bored here. Six years are too long. I want to go somewhere with my brother. Be patient, okay? He will be back. The maid patiently rubbed Terai's smooth skin with some kind of herbal scrub. The princess was so spoiled that she never lifted a finger to wash herself, not to mention dressing on her own. Everything had to be done by her nanny. Your Highness, please go to the main hall. His Majesty is waiting for you. I don't want to. I beg you, Your Highness. His Majesty has given a decree. The beautiful princess pouted. Her mood was easily swayed. He stood angrily and moved out of her room. Stop ordering me around. I'm not a child. Your Highness. The face veiled maid followed the princess through the hallway, which was textured like a wooden tunnel. The corridor's pattern gave the impression that they literally lived inside the tree. 
The princess arrived in a spacious room after walking for a while. It was a hall-like space with a large altar in the center, decorated with a long table with various kinds of fruits. A dozen people sat around the long table. They were a group of senior elves that had served the monarch for hundreds of years. They were all looking at a princess who had just entered the king's altar. Wohoho! The most beautiful creature on the continent is out of the room. I'm tired of being locked up. Set me free. I'm not a child. Everyone smiled as Terai's yelled, with the exception of a dashing figure on the altar. He was King Phalesa, the Valora Kingdom's monarch. His pride weighed heavily on him. Despite his 240 years, his face was wrinkle-free. Do you know what it's like to have a daughter? The elders laughed as the king complained. Terai's, meanwhile, remained pouting, with her shoulders rising even more and her cheeks puffing out. Father, I'm tired of six years in a room. How long will I be locked up? Until you are old enough. I'm 95. You're a teenager. Don't equate our age with humans. And stop studying those people. Particularly the humans behind the portal. They are evil. Terai's lips started to wiggle. She sobbed because she did not obtain what she desired. On the other hand, the monarch did not dare to look at her. He was terrified of sympathy. While staring in a different direction, the monarch continued to talk. And stop bothering Vark. Your brother ran away because you were too spoiled. Tear eyes cried louder. Everyone rubbed their foreheads when the princess sat on the floor. Her two feet were twitching on the ground like a toddler fussing for a toy. Her way of throwing a tantrum was too bizarre for her age. Compared to human standards, Terai's was supposed to be a teenager at her sweet sixteen. I want Varg to be here. Calm down, please don't cry. The king lowered his voice and completely lost his dignity. I don't care. He has to be here. I want my brother back. You've promised me. Known as a gallant and respected by everyone, King Phalesa appeared so frail when his daughter showed a tear. His smile twitched. The brave king jumped down from the throne and squatted next to her. Your brother goes to school on earth. If you call him, he'll get angry. Do you want Vard to hate you? The king spoke softly with a voice that was made up as if he were talking to a toddler. His lips were twisted when he tried to calm her down. Really? Sure, Vard told me himself. When he graduates, he'll come here for you. He will carry you around like he used to, or lulling you every time you sleep. He will bring everything you want from earth. A smartphone? She enthusiastically smiled. Yes. Just wait, okay? Terai's face brightened. The king, meanwhile, massaged his forehead because the most honest man was obviously lying. Even a fool would know right away. Still, Terai's nodded innocently, just like a five-year-old human baby. While waiting your brother, you can ask for anything. Fancy clothes? The most delicious fruits? The most expensive books? Everything. I want books. You are free to read anything in the library. Terai's thought for a moment. Her eyes wandered as she childishly put her index finger to her own lips. Then I want to read Kama Sutra. Varg used to read it. Everyone was stunned. Especially the king. Apparently, Terai's was not allowed to read that book yet. Father, I don't know why he was forbidding me to read that. There were so many strange drawings of. Ah, uh, not that book. The king hurriedly interrupted. If you read that book, Varg will get angry. Do you want him to get angry at you? No. Wait for your brother if you want to read it. Go outside. You're free to leave the palace. With innocent cheers, Terai's walked out of the hall after the king had lied again. Damn it you Varg. What have you done to your sister? King Phalesa let out a long sigh. Terai's had become more and more different since her brother was resurrected. Varg indeed became someone else. But his love for Terai's would never change. And he was the one who asked to isolate his sister. Marriage proposals kept coming. Varg would never let his cute little sister be taken. Your Majesty, Princess is not a baby anymore. She has passed ninety. Please treat her like her age. Don't reject any more marriage proposals. Say that again, I'll cut your head off. The king replied with a face full of anger. Forgive me, Your Majesty. Of course, King Phalesa was well aware that Terai's had passed her coming of age. But he did not want to accept his daughter's puberty. Both the king and prince considered Terai's a baby who was on all fours. Your majesty, our people are questioning the prince. They want you to stop exiling him. You want that brat, huh? Ah, uh, perhaps his mischievous nature is Yggdrasil's gift to our people. An elder answered with an awkward smile. King Phalesa squinted. Varg was no longer the same sweet, obedient child who had a soft heart. The crown prince had changed completely to be a nasty creature. 
He was a troublemaker that all elders said yes for exiling. And now they asked to call him back? Your Majesty, I know we are in contract with Her Highness Lore. Don't mention that which nobody dared to speak again. King Falesa took a deep breath. His feelings were so mixed. Maybe the witch was right that Valora needed a new kind of king. Being a pacifist wasn't an option anymore. Due to the heroes of the gods, the elves had to throw away their traditions and accept the new order. Let's go to Armin Kingdom. Sanar is waiting for us. Rinui, Armin Kingdom's capital city. Horse-drawn carriages drove through Rinui's road in a parade. One of them was a wooden carriage pulled by a horned horse, a sacred creature known as Unicorn. It was the chariot that King Falesa and his five elders rode in. Seven years ago the capital of Armin was not this big, said an elder. Yes, Mr. Polanti, their buildings are getting taller. Human civilization is advancing. Another elder replied. The elves indeed resided the trees. It could be said that they were isolated. The Valora kingdom nevertheless desired to engage in diplomatic relations with its neighbors, also interacted with humans through trade routes, tourism and cultural interactions, particularly to the nearby nation known as the Armin Kingdom. It was rumored that the first Armin King's second bride was the twin sister of King Falesa himself. Their bond was quite strong. You see that? Lumina Cathedral is getting bigger. The royal palace is also magnificent. King Falesa was silent as the elders kept acting like a bunch of country bumpkins. He was quite aware that seven years was not short for short-lived people. Rinu became more grander. Its territory was expanding. King Falesa was also amazed although his face looked flat. Humans were so amazing. His Majesty King Falesa has arrived. The elf king walked tall among human soldiers. They bowed respectfully to a king of different races, which were tied together by hundreds of years of history. The kingdom of Armin held the elves in the highest regard. The inhabitants viewed the land of Valora as a sacred entity. Even their monarch ran cheerfully as soon as he saw the handsome elf figure. Grandpa, welcome. King Armin III reigned for seventy years. But in Falesa's presence, the wrinkled man always acted like a child. Because Falesa was indeed his own grandfather. Even though there was no blood relationship between them, King Armin III acted spoiled whenever Falesa around. Don't whine about being carried, Sunar. Remember your age. Where is Uncle Vark? The old king cheerfully looking around to find someone. Maybe looking around for human ladies or whatsoever. We'd better discuss the sealing ceremony. Ha 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 ha. Have a seat. Some of King Armin III's nobles bowed graciously with him. Their smiles were genuine and sincere. The nobility hurried for pleasantries as though they had encountered an idol. That was Falesa's charisma in the Armin kingdom. Although, unfortunately, his charisma wasn't felt by some nobles on different corner. TSK. Those long ears are just ruining our plans. A noble stared sarcastically observing the elves from a distance and keeping away from the royal guests, as if they were the source of a disease. Be respectful, Count Vardant, at least pretend to be. Admonished one of them, giving a fake smile among the invited guests. Those nobles stood out significantly from the others. Their faces were charming and young, almost as beautiful as the stature of the elves, even though they were nowhere near as fit as King Falesa. They seemed to hate the elves' presence. Because, in fact, they were nobles who came from the world behind the portal. Yes, they were walker nobles. TSK, if only Earth allowed slavery, I'd sell those elves. Cursed Count Vardant. Badab. Sink. The atmosphere immediately changed. What did you say? Everyone fell in silence when the elf spoke slowly. Falace's face became cold. Even though they were far apart, his long ears twitched as if he heard Vardant's curse. You want to enslave the elves? His voice became deeper, lower, and more threatening. The atmosphere was instantly tensed as the king glanced quietly at the crowd of walker nobles. All of them appeared to be suffocating. They collapsed to the ground like someone who was out of breath. All of their faces were pallid. Some had passed out, their lips frothing. Grandpa, please stop! King Armin III immediately recognized the problem. He bowed to King Falesa and asked him to calm down. He then moved his irritated expression to the side of the walker nobles. King Armin III was genuinely enraged. I don't know if Earth teaches manners. If you can't honor a guest, get out of my place. Fyok, elven bastard. Bam, bam, bam. At the manor, Varden slammed the table in rage. He felt humiliated after being kicked out of the royal palace. How could King Armin be more loyal to the elf than a hero like him? Who the heck are they? 
Varden lost his mind because his title was just about to be revoked. Because of Elf Bastard I almost died seven years ago. Has King Armin forgotten? Cool your head, your highness. Please be patient. A knight tried to calm him down. Varden laid down and stared at the ceiling. He tried to smile by recalling his struggles as the walker. In the past, before he awakened, he was a loser. He did nothing but lock himself in the room, just like a normal-looking nerd, whom the bully loved to torture most. But everything changed after the appearance of a small tattoo on his hand. That was the tattoo of an ice sword, a sign that he was blessed by Hiemza, the god of Frozen. TSK, I wish there was a way to destroy the elven. There is. Suddenly, a crystal showed a faint light. Count Vardant was stunned. He immediately knelt down knowing that the voice belonged to the leader of all walker in Indonesia. What should I do, your excellency? Valora elves will hold a portal sealing ceremony. Bring your strongest team to Dragona Cave. Find the elf shaman. Finish them off. The count's expression stiffed in shock. No matter how bad his hatred to the elf was, releasing dragon army was out of question. Millions of people could die. My city could be destroyed. This wasn't part of the plan. This is not a suggestion. This is an order replied the light before fading into void. 2. Chapter 6. Unforgivable Sins. Next. Chapter 6. Unforgivable Sins. Dragona Cave, north side of Crocosila. All the people on the Boreella continent had faith in the same legend. They believed that there was a mythical kingdom somewhere in Dragona Mountain. It said that hordes of ferocious reptiles would crawl out to destroy the continent every seven years. Tales of the apocalypse were preserved for generations. However, the ferocious beast had never appeared in thousands of years. People either knew what the dragon army looked like nor ever encountered them. The myth had faded away. Particularly for Walker, a group of earthlings who were too modern to believe a groundless legend. The novice Walker even often hunted in Dragona Cave with no worry at all. Did the dragon army exist? In fact yes, someone had witnessed their existence. He almost died seven years ago when the beasts were unleashed. And the survivor was, surprisingly, a walker named Count Vardant. He was lucky enough to go home alive after encountering the disaster. Damn it! I hate this job. My lord, do dragon army exist? Yes, they are exist. I saw it with my own eyes seven years ago. Fuck. I don't want to do this. On horseback toward Dragona Cave, Count Vardant kept swearing. The traumatic event had been carved on his skin. The fear was real. The ruler of Crocosila was too scared that his subordinate didn't dare to show a doubt. My lord, if they exist, why don't they ever come out? Elvin. Valoran? Yes. That disgusting long ear seals the portal every seven years. So the dragon army will not come out of the Dragona cave. His men were all pallid. They remained silent until they arrived to the cave's entrance. The hesitancy was palpable. The count's story totally altered their perspective. This is crazy. Dragona Cave was so big that they questioned what creatures would come out. Its height reached 30 meters, 100 feet, and the width was almost 100 meters, 330 feet. With its enormity, the story that the cave was the Dragon Army's exit began to make sense. They entered the cave with complicated minds. Count Vardant's subordinates started to figure out why no single nation dared to wage a war against Valora. They had been respected because of their role as guardians. The elves naturally had a bargaining chip as a race that could not be touched. Boreella's continent could be destroyed without their sealing ritual. And today, they had been tasked to sabotage the elves' duty. My lord, is this okay? We will be the one who responsible for the destruction. Yes, my lord. We could be hanged if we are caught killing the elves. This is an unforgivable sin, the count could not answer. A spark of doubt was clearly seen in his eyes. He was also aware his ridiculous mission could destroy the entire continent. Of course, not all his subordinates were smart enough to read the room. Don't worry, we've prepared well. We won't die. A two meter, six feet eight inches, tall baron with a viking helmet persuaded his friend. With all respect, Baron Frederick, this mission is nonsense. We are the brave warrior, and they trusted us to do it. Just shut up and do the job. The big guy puffed his chest. Count Vardant didn't care when Baron Frederick asserted his authority toward members below him. The big guy was always acting like that. The Count was more worried about himself, as he had been tasked with sabotaging shamanic rituals. Vardant felt uneasy with every step. His body continued to tremble, and his expression was twisted. 
Crocosila City would be the first to be devastated if the dragon army was unleashed. Take it easy, your highness. We're professional. What are you worried about? Ha ha. The count gave a flat glance when Baron Frederick, the big guy wearing a Viking helmet, spoke like someone with brains. Baron Frederick seemed to know nothing about the situation. He wasn't even aware he had been treated as cannon fodder by higher-ups. It was a common thing in politics. Vardant and his men did the nut job because his boss was a nasty guy. Let's finish the job and enjoy the payment, your highness. Once more, the big guy puffed his chest. What will go wrong, anyway? If the dragon army attacked Crocosila, your manor would be gone. Poof, your money evaporated. Vardan answered sarcastically. What? Are you serious? Have you realized yet? Wow, you're so smart, Frederick. The big guy was shocked into disbelief. He was too stupid to realize a simple logic. As a baron in Crocosila, if dragon army was unleashed, his manor would burn to ash, and his serfs, slaves, and even his cows would be eaten alive. I have to save my assets, and make everyone suspicious of us. Stop talking. I lost 47 of my brain cells just to talk with you alone. Count Vardant, Baron Frederick, and four other men walked silently into the cave. All of them wore their best armor and magic weapons. Their enemies were magical beings. Elves were a strong race that trained their battle prowess for hundreds of years. The mission wasn't a walk in the park. PSSTT, they are coming. He gave a hand sign. Deep in the deepest part of the cave, several elves were drawing a magic circle. Varden hid with six drank walkers around him, observing the elves' activities before making the move. There are three elf shamans. Their magic is no joke. But their physique is like shit. Let's wait until their magic runs out. Varden explained, pointing to other two elves which stand in guard in the distance. And they are elf warriors. Their physical strength is equivalent to cranked walker. Too risky to fight head on. Better use poison. Wait for my command. They looked frail. Let's attack them now. Wanna die alone? Go ahead. Baron Frederick shut his mouth. Three shaman elves danced on the circle a little while later. All of their face were gorgeous, and their moves were mesmerizing. The beauty of female elves was a piece of art. Vardant got annoyed when his follower was being charmed. Are we watching girl bands or something? You are paid to fight. Stay focused. Pardon us, your highness, but they are so stunning. Even male elves are more beautiful than my girlfriend. Are we obliged to kill them? The Count became more irritated, but he was smart enough to realize his member's motivation. The risks were too big for a job that gave nothing. If they are not killed, they will succeed in performing the ritual. He responded as patiently as he could. His men were still skeptical, nevertheless. One of them even questioned why he should thwart the ceremony that was supposed to save them from destruction. Reluctantly, Vardant gave them a reason. If we're able to sabotage their ritual, Valor would be blamed and no nation would stop us from invading their kingdom. What are our benefits if the war happen? You will get whatever female elves you want. All his men were shocked. Are you serious? Can we enslave them all? Yes. Let's do the job and talk later. Their motivation rose along with the thing inside their pants. Sleeping with an elf was a faraway dream that could not happen, regardless of how much money a walker had. The chance had come. They couldn't wait to rape them all. The ritual is almost complete. Let's go. They wore the masks and started to move. The seven walkers were confident enough when the shamans sat on their knees. Their magic power had run out. Perfect time to attack. The elves were confused when they were struck by poisonous darts. Don't spare a single elf. Finish them off. The elves were androgynous beings. Their gender was difficult to determine. Their males had a feminine appearance and slender bodies like females. They didn't have the same muscle shapes as humans nor did they have testosterone features like facial hair. A random purple-haired feminist on earth could overpower their masculinity. Female elves, on the other hand, were flat-chested and almost identical to their male counterparts. They were naturally born as frail creatures. Yes, they were supposed to be weak. Weak my ass! They are tough. Damn it! Failed to parry their sword, a walker was thrown away a few yards. They supplement their strength with magic. Be careful. Three shaman elves were dead. One of them had managed to cast ridiculous magic while dying. One of Vardant's men had been killed. Despite running out of prana, or the elven version of mana, their magic remained terrifying. Count Vardan had a hard time ganging up on the remaining two opponents. Clank. His hands were shaking as his sword clashed. Vardan was even pushed back. 
the elf warrior's strength was no joke. He struggled to find an opening to counteract. Three against one won't work. He yelled amidst the battle. Frederick, hold off the other one. Fight him alone? I could die. Just block him. We have to kill them one by one. Vardin communicated in Baisa, Indonesia. Thus their opponent had no idea what he was talking about. Intelligence humanoid beings were annoying opponents. They didn't have a distinct pattern like monsters. Their movements were unpredictable. And they had hundreds of years of battle experience. So Vardin's combat abilities were practically useless. Damn it. They're not NPCs. Our experience gaps are too wide. We are the NPCs. We are moved with obvious pattern. Walker used to fight with a game-like movement. Obviously, as modern humans, they neither learn how to swing a sword nor how to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Their fighting ability was dependent on passive skills, which made their bodies move automatically. That was the nature of the power system. If they wanted to be stronger, all they had to do was level up their skills with experience points. Count Varden had a hard time, although he fought the elf 5 versus 1. Another one of his men died with his head cut off. Their opponent was too swift. Of course, as a walker, Varden also had several active skills that sacrificed his mana pool. Make him busy! I, my lord! Varden raised his sword. His mouth spoke slowly for incantation. O oh, mighty Hiemza, bestow on me your grace. Show them how cold your anger is toward the world. The temperature dropped significantly when his clear ice sword shined a blue light. The elf warrior stepped back when he realized what spell Varden had cast. However, three of Varden's subordinates blocked his escape. They tried their best to hold until their boss completed the ultimate skill. Absoluta nulla volmus! The faint blue light moved fast toward the enemy when Varden slashed his sword. The skill changed the temperature on the pathway to absolute zero, freezing everything and generating rows of ice spears. The elf warrior could not block. He was unable to move when his feet were frozen. Slash. His head flew high on the second slash. Ping. You have slain a rank C Valoran warrior. Level up. Level up. Level up. Vardant breath was labored. Slaying a mere cranked elf warrior was harder than fighting against a boss monster. They were completely different levels from walkers with similar ranks. If he didn't poison them in a preemptive strike, the battle would be impossible. Splash. Ugh, the Count snapped back to reality when he saw an arrow strike his subordinate's eyes. He died on the spot after being hit four times. The Viking guy had failed to hold off the remaining opponent. Unsurprisingly, Elves' archery was another thing that made them dangerous foes to deal with. Frederick, you asshole. He was enraged when he found out that the big guy had run away. The last elf warrior shot his arrow with ridiculous power. Vardant and his two remaining subordinates were hiding in terror. It said that an elf's arrow speed was similar to a 9mm pistol's muzzle velocity. It was 6 to 8 times the average crossbow bolt. With an arrow weighing 500 grams, 1 pound, the damage was a whopping 2,300 joules of kinetic energy. They easily penetrated high-quality knight's armor made from tempered steel. Damn it! Kill him! The battle continued with a sad result. Valora Royal Palace. A week later, five elves' bodies lay headless at the altar of Valora's palace. All the elders were terrified. The death of the shamans marked the start of a disaster. The sealing ritual must have failed. The dragon army would certainly come out and put the entire kingdom, including Valora itself, in jeopardy. Who did this? King Phalesa sat uncomfortably on the throne. He was drowning in thoughts and possibilities. It was too late to fix everything. For the first time in thousands of years, the Valora kingdom had failed to seal the cave. Your majesty, why is this happening? The Armin kingdom and all nations in Boreala would blame us. The continent is doomed. Yes, your majesty. We could be in trouble. Our relationship with Armin could be heated. In truth, Terai's caused Dragona cave to heat up seven years ago. That girl was far too sedentary. When she was appointed as a shaman, she did it half-heartedly. The portal had been activated. The dragon army was on the verge of emerging from the cave. As a result, a hero of the gods died because of one careless act. What should we do, your majesty? Yes, we have committed an unforgivable sin. Because of us, millions of people will die. Phalesa breathed heavily as the elders showed their nature. Old men like them were more prone to complaining than thinking rationally. The king was well aware that there was no way back. The dragona portal could no longer be closed. However, discussing something that couldn't be dealt with was meaningless. 
it was a waste of time. The king decided to investigate the murder of the three shamans and their two bodyguards. What was their purpose? And what did they want from the appearance of the dragon army? The destruction of the continent? Certainly not possible. That reason was too naive. Even the most oblivious demon were not that stupid. Falesa considered many possibilities until he remembered the last month events. There was no mistaking it. The culprit was definitely the heroes of the gods. Falesa just realized that the Walker nobles had apparent expressions. At the conference, they were too composed. Their friendliness was staged, and they acted like people who hid something. Obviously, those confident faces said that they had a hideous plan on their minds. Moreover, he received a letter that answered his suspicion. They're worse than demons. An elder approached when the king was calling him. He was the only elder with whom Falesa could communicate. Reading the letter with a leaf stamp, the elder was enraged. He chose to leave with Falesa for a more quiet place. Other elders would make a fuss if he carelessly leaked the information. Uncle Polanti, alert our military. Produce more arrows. Set up barricades and traps all over the Armand Kingdom's borders. Falesa spoke when no one else was around. Your Majesty, are we going to war? The king nodded in response to the obvious question. Despite the fact that his kingdom was on the verge of ruin, his demeanor was composed. The war would begin sooner than he had imagined. He stamped the parchment with the royal seal after writing a letter. Ask her to smuggle this letter to earth. My son has to know that his homeland is in danger. 1. 